Father God, we thank you so much for your, your sovereignty, your love, your blessings, your mercy, your long-sufferingness towards us, even when we are exhibiting some of our worst behavior. We're thankful for your grace, your mercy, your providence. We ask your continual forgiveness of our repented sins. We also ask that you be with the preached word here this morning, that you guide it and that it falls upon fertile ground and hearts and minds that are not just willing to uh, hear your word, but to actually apply it to daily life living. Again, bless this church, bless the leaders here, all of their wives, every member within this congregation and every family represented by this congregation that you continue to bless this work. We ask this in the great name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Now, I'm looking around. This is, this is a dangerous place because I don't even see a clock. <laughs> this is truly a preacher's church, I guess. <laughs> There's no clock. I'm going to keep time, though. But wow, I can't. I don't see anything. I, I appreciate the, the deep hospitality of uh, the men and women of this, this fine congregation. It's been uh, an exceptional experience thus far. Thankful to Brother Moore for picking me up from, uh, from the airport. and We just jump, jumped right into conversation uh, on our way back from the airport and even on our, on our way here. Thank you, Preacher, for uh, taking me to dinner last night and uh, the, the fine sister that, that arranged everything for us so that I'm, I'm just thankful to be here. Uh, my wife and children couldn't be here with us, but they also send uh, their love. I, I, I love your preacher deeply. Uh, I am indebted to him. As was acknowledged, I've been the minister for the West Oakland Church of Christ for almost 17 uh, years, and I believe it was in 2002 that uh, Dr. Winrow came and, and facilitated uh, a gospel meeting for me, and I was able to spend that entire uh, week with him. So not only did he preach, but we went to breakfast every day together. We had lunch and dinner today, uh, every, every day together. And I, I just learned so much from him during that particular uh, six-day uh, experience. And so I'm thankful to have the invitation to be here uh, with you today. So without any further ado, I, I, could, I could just talk about so many different people that are here, as well as the worship experience uh, that we just had. But I know I have a sermon I'm supposed to preach but I know one, one interesting experience I did have that I can't help but share. Now, Dr. Winrow said, we stand, you stand during praise and worship. Then had us sit for meditation. Well, I felt like jumping up on that song, too. <laughs> so I'm sitting over there quenching the spirit because I wanted to stay orderly and stay in my seat. But mercy, Lord, mercy, Lord. I, Isaiah chapter 40, Isaiah Isaiah chapter 40, again, I bring you greetings from the West Oakland uh, Church of Christ. Isaiah chapter 40, we will start verse 28, end around verse 31. We'll make a few points within this passage, and we will uh, dive a bit deeper into our uh, sermonic discourse. Bible says in verse 28, hast thou not known? Hast thou not heard that the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, fainteth not, neither is weary? In other words, have you heard that? There's no searching of his understanding. He giveth power to the faint, and to them that have no might, he increaseth. He increaseth strength. Even the youth shall faint and be weary. And the young men shall utterly 
fall. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings of eagles or as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. So we will use as a theme for this particular sermon, the theme of your homecoming celebration and anniversary. Growing stronger, going deeper, and shining brighter, or glowing brighter. So since this passage is connected to your thematic premise for this particular uh, special day that you are having, I wanted to at least touch on it briefly before we move into some other additional areas. But somehow within this text, there is a backdrop that's taking place in relationship to some of the idolatrous worship that the nation of Israel had slipped into and somehow there is a conversation about these gods or these deities, but the inefficiency of these gods and these deities. And there was one conversation about how with these particular gods and with these particular deities, as well as those that they empower, that every now and then they become fatigued, that every now and then they become weary, that every now and then they cannot maintain the fight that they have been called to fight. And so therefore, prophet Isaiah juxtaposes what it means to be under the auspices of God as opposed to being under the control of a false God or a false deity. Because when you're under the false control of a God or deity that is steeped under paganistic ritualism and things of that nature, it means that we are not empowered by the Most High God. So Prophet Isaiah is juxtaposing here to make sure that there is a comparison and a contrast to what can happen when someone is under the powerful influence of a false God versus being under the influence of the awesome power of almighty God. So he, he, he brings it to a crescendo with verse 31 and says, but they, but they that wait on the Lord, not a false God, not a God made out of stone, not a God made out of wood, not a God made or fashioned out of gold or a God fashioned out of bronze or a God fashioned out of silver, but they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and they shall faint not. Now, now oftentimes we focus on, on the paradigm of the fact that we shall mount up with wings as eagles. Now, the reality is the eagle mounts upward so that it can ultimately fly downward. So it's not just about how high we can get, because when the eagle mounts up in a high fashion, it's really so the eagle can look down and spot its prey, spot its breakfast, spot its lunch, spot its dinner, so we can zoom down. Now, here's, the, here's some of the, the anatomy of an eagle. I'm not going to stay here long, but, but since it's part of your text, we might as well pull this out. Now, an eagle flies back and forth between 50 to 70 miles per hour. So when an eagle is going from one destination to another, Brother Campbell, the eagle can majestically fly 50 to 70 miles per hour. But that's not the piece we need to be focused upon. The part we need, to, we need to be focused upon is the fact that when an eagle spots its prey, it can fly 50 to 70 miles per hour to and fro. But when it spots its prey or sets its focus, ah, come on this side, when it sets its focus on its prey, 
it dives at 100 miles per hour. So while we're talking about growing stronger, going deeper, and glowing brighter, what we must understand is it's not just about how high you get, but it's about have you set your focus on God? Have you set your focus on your purpose? Have you set your focus on your ministry? Have you set your focus on what God has called you to do? Because while you're flying back and forth at 50 to 70 miles per hour, that's good. That's cute. That looks awesome. But it's not until you set your focus on your purpose in life and the God that has called you into life that you start diving at 100 miles. Per hour. So it looks good out there just flying to and fro and you're moving quite rapidly. But this particular spiritual business that we're in is not just about flying to and fro. It's about setting our focus on the prey, setting our focus on the purpose and diving in an undistracted modality. So since we're talking about growing stronger, there's some elements here. If we keep in mind Galatians chapter 5, just under the, under the notion of growing stronger. We'll deal with growing stronger, going deeper, and we'll close with glowing brighter. Because all of that fits under a Christian motif and how we are called and what we've been chosen to engage in and to carry out. Now, in, in, in Galatians chapter 5, around verse 19, the Apostle Paul starts giving us a, a list of things that are rooted in a sinful lifestyle. He begins talking to us about fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, and all of those things. So as you go through uh, verse 19 all the way through 20, he's giving us various vices that may, might be referred to as, as lust of the flesh. And we're also given a promise that if we engage in those types of things, we will not inherit the kingdom of God. But then as part of that list, he then switches into the positive. And, and, and the, the switch that he makes into the positive is absolutely essential for every single child of God. He says that the fruit of the Spirit, fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. And it's so deep, he says, that against such there is no law. That's why for, for children of God, on your job, even though they give you the orientation, the do's and don'ts about how to, how to do this, how not to do this, they talk to you about different moral clauses and things of that nature, but a child of God, we never needed that script. Uh, because we operate under the fruit of this. I came into this facility. I came into this institution already making manifest love, joy, peace, long suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance against such there is no law. Meaning I didn't even need your manual. I didn't need your manual to teach me how to be a good employee. I didn't need your manual to teach me how to engage in collaborative relationships with those in which I work because I operate under the premise of love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, as well as temperance. Now, but here's the thing. When it, when, when it comes to the reality of growing stronger, making manifest the fruit of the Spirit is a gift that is given to us upon conversion. It is the beginning episode of what it means to be a child of God. So immediately upon being born or reborn into the body of Christ, God immediately infuses within us the efficacious work of his Holy Spirit that then gives us the ability to act out of and function out of love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness. But, but that is something that only comes 
upon conversion. It is not something that comes with time served. Part of my concern in the body of Christ, and I'm, I'm not saying this is anybody here at Reseda. I know y'all got it absolutely all together. But part of my concern in the kingdom is people have been baptized but have never been converted. People have been immersed in water but had never come to Christ previously by faith and repentance. Because in some circles we've made baptism the ultimate pinnacle of salvation and threw everything else off. I can't get the Holy Spirit of God without actually being converted. Meaning, I can't make manifest the gift of the fruit of the Spirit without actually being a converted child of God. And I can't become a converted child of God just because I've been hanging around Christian folk for 20 years. So if I'm truly going to grow stronger, First of all, I have to make sure that my conversion was actually a conversion or else I'm trying to be a Christian without the equipment required for being a Christian. So you can't love the way you're supposed to love if you are not a recipient of the gift of the Holy Spirit of God. You can't be long-suffering the way you're supposed to be loved. Oh, you can be long-suffering outside of moments of crisis, but when crisis comes, if you don't have the Holy Spirit working within you, you falter, you fail, you end up becoming weary, you end up becoming fatigued under a spiritual lens because you don't have what God gave to you to be successful. Go, go quickly, go 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 10, just to give you another piece around, around growing stronger. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, uh, just in relationship to, to growing, growing stronger, we'll start around verse, verse number one. We'll actually start around, around verse, number, verse number three. Now, so we're saying under the, under the conception of growing stronger, first of all, we have to make sure we are actually recipients of the Holy Spirit because he is the one that makes us work. Hmm. He is the one that gives us the spiritual energy and resolve to be who we are supposed to be in Christ. He is our motivating agent and element within us that helps us be a person of light. That without him, we're who we were before someone came to Christ. But God didn't come and God didn't call us and God did not choose us for us to remain who we were before we came to him. We should be radically different. I don't know who I'm talking to. First, Second Corinthians chapter 10, verse number three. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. Look what Paul says. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ and having in a readiness to revenge all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. Now, just focusing on verse four, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Now, if I want to grow stronger. I have to have the right understanding of what a stronghold actually is. Because just based upon terminology alone, a stronghold can easily sound like it's something that it's not. Now, number one in scripture, for, for the most part, the Bible refers to the concept of a stronghold in the positive. In other words, a stronghold literally is, is, is a military fortress that is hard to attack, but easy to defend. A stronghold is hard to attack, but easy to defend. So if there is a stronghold, God is saying, those who are trying to attack it will have difficulty attacking it but those who are trying to defend it 
will have a much easier time trying to defend it because while they're trying to get at it, they're at a disadvantage, which, give, which gives you and I the opportunity to defeat that which is attacking us. Yes, However, a stronghold from a sinful perspective is not something that has a strong grip on the child of God. A stronghold, spiritually speaking, is something that the child of God has a grip on. And, and so then, because I'm the one, I'm, I'm just talking here, I'm not talking to anybody specifically. Again, I know there's nobody here like this. I'm just giving you information you can share with somebody else. So therefore, that, that bottle of Hennessy, just as an example, <laughs> that bottle of Hennessy in and of itself has no power over you and I. It is an inanimate object sitting there all by itself without life. It doesn't have life until we give it life. But right now we're somewhere sitting on a shelf, hopefully in a store. And wherever it's sitting, it has no life right now. So here's how the stronghold comes into play. I refuse to let go of my stronghold. And then when you start talking to me about my sin problem, Brother Moore, now my stronghold is hard for you to attack, easy for me to defend. I won't let it go. So when you come to me, I got my spiel together to justify why I need what's in my hand as my stronghold. I got my spill together because since it's mine, I know how to defend it and it's hard for you to attack it because it's mine. And really, I'm just afraid to experience life by letting go of my stronghold. Now, now most of the time, we, we placate the situation and teach it and preach it as if the stronghold has a grip on us. Now, if you want to go stronger, we must understand it doesn't have a grip on us. We have a grip on it. And growing stronger is the process of figuring out how to let go of your stronghold. So what has you? What, what is your hand around that you are fearful of letting go? Well, I, I, I just don't know what life will be like if I let him go. I, I, I just don't know what life would be like if I let her go. I, 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 I just don't know what life would be like if I move out of this situation. Because my stronghold has become so familiar to me that now even though I know it's rooted and connected under the auspices of sin, but this sin has become my life. I don't know what life would be like if I let go of my stronghold. So not, not only is this about growing stronger, but it's also about going deeper. So in relationship to, to, to second, second Peter chapter one, we know that the Holy Spirit, he's given to us immediately upon conversion. Upon conversion, we are impregnated with the powerful work of the Holy Spirit. I, ho I hope we get that. I, 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 hope, I hope we understand that it is him who helps us be who we are supposed to be in Christ. And that is a gift given to us immediately. Now, now when God blesses us with the Holy Spirit that gives us the ability to make manifest the fruit of the spirit. He gives him to us in full measure. God does not give to us his Holy Spirit in piecemeal situations. Upon conversion, we have full access to his power. Now, I'm not talking about the miraculous. 
I'm talking about in, in, in relationship to things like love, joy, peace, long suffering, long suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, that God gives us the ability to utilize all of those attributes and, and personality uh, uh, dynamics that make the Holy Spirit what he is at a, as a manifested element out and through our lives. But when we are converted and after baptism, whatever addictions, habits, customs, desires you and I had, after our conversion experience, you still have them, if, if you're honest. You went down in water, you repented. You went down in water with, I'll just stay on that, I don't know why. You went down in water as a person who craved Hennessy. You come up out of the water, depending on how cute we want to be, how honest we want to be. We come up out of the water still with a craving. Doesn't mean we're acting upon it, but it still calls us. Still has our name on it. Yeah, I was talking to Brother Moore about this in the car. So, my, my wife and I were always doing these, these different fasts and things of that nature. So, so I, 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 I stopped two years ago eating red meat and pork. And then in July, I stopped eating chicken and turkey. So I do seafood. Now, now here's my wife. My wife will say things like, oh, the stuff that I stopped eating, <clears throat> I no longer have a desire for anymore. Well, that's not me, Dr. Winrow. I keep it real. <laughs> Although I have not had a bacon double cheeseburger in two years, I still want one every day. <laughs> now, we got to just be honest. Let's just be honest. We got to just be honest about some stuff. That although I, mo I may no longer be engaging in the activity, it does not mean that the activity does not still call me. So even though you are conver converted, cute child of God, don't act like the stuff that used to call you don't still call you anymore. It's not a sin to acknowledge that a life of sin still calls you. Acknowledging it actually emphasizes the power of God in your life. Yeah. If eating a cheeseburger was a sin, <laughs> and I can confess to you that I still want one, God is glorified in the process because although I want one, I have not engaged in one. So then to God, be the powerful glory because of the power within me to restrain. Yes. So, due, due to that reality, you're converted. You still have a desire, still have a call toward these sinful dynamics. So not only are we blessed with the immediate ability of the Holy Spirit, and we learn more and more about him as we move forward. And as we learn more and more about the Holy Spirit, it's not that God just gave us another dosage of his power. No, he just grew us spiritually and psychologically to understand how much of a resource he is. You might still be on love. Maybe you haven't got to long suffering yet, but it's not that God hasn't given you the ability. Oh, he's in there. I, I, rem I remember, I'm digressing, I'm sorry. I, I remember the first time I bought a, 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 a desktop computer. And I, and I got it home and, and, and I set everything up and then on the back of the computer, I saw these ports. But there was no plug, Brother Moore, to go into the ports. So I'm thinking that the store must have left something out 
because there's everything is plugged in, but there's still a couple of ports missing. Now, this is like 15 to almost 20 years ago. There's still two ports missing. And then a couple of months or maybe even a year goes by and I'm introduced to a flash drive. So in other words, the manufacturer had built within this CPU system some technological ability that hadn't even been placed on the market yet, but they already knew it was coming. So on the device, the plug was there. So when people went out and bought it, they could plug it right in. That's how the Holy Spirit is. When we learn to love better, when, when, when we learn how, how, how to be better, it's not that God just did. The Holy Spirit already had all of the ports in your life. You just had not, I just had not figured out how to plug in yet. But he introduced himself to you and I in full measure. It just takes us time to figure out the technology. So, so as, as we grow, 2 Peter 1, 1, 2 Peter 1 uh, tells us, starting in, in verse number 4, God says to, to, to help us with some of these continuing habits and hang-ups that we have. He says, now, whereby are given unto us the exceeding great and precious promises, that by these we might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Then he says, beside this, giving all diligence, this is in addition to the efficacious work of the Holy Spirit. He says, beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith, virtue, and to virtue, knowledge, and to knowledge, temperance, and to temperance, patience, and to patience, godliness, and to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, charity. For if you do these things and abound, they make you, look how powerful the Holy Spirit is. He says, if you do these things, they will make you so that you are neither barren nor unfruitful of the knowledge of the Lord, of the knowledge of our Lord and Savior. Jesus, he says, and those who don't have this are blind and they cannot see afar off. So, so growing stronger, we are immediately equipped to be able to deal with everything God allows us to encounter. And we, we know we have to engage in a battle in terms of growing stronger, to deal with our strongholds. But then God is acknowledging to us that after your conversion, there's still some things that you need to help you grow deeper. So to grow deeper, you need to add to your faith virtue. See, it, now you can start dealing with the cheeseburger. Because now you're going to add to your faith virtue to virtue knowledge, to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, to patience godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, which means we are all born from the same womb. Charity, all of those different things that now help us with letting go of our strongholds. So I'm striving to grow stronger, but now I'm also striving to grow and go deeper to help me start knocking off one by one all of my sin vices, but that starts by adding to my, to my faith. Now, just in terms of glowing, glowing brighter, Paul talked about in Romans 12, he talked about walking as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service, your latria. But then he says, be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So now we're in the business of glowing brighter. Now, we don't use this terminology often, but when, when, when the Apostle Paul 
created or wrote this text based upon the inspiration of God. When he said, be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. This is the process of the child of God now glowing brighter. Why am I saying that? This process is actually deeper than just the linguistic terminology of transformation or transforming. Because somewhere in the Bible it records that even the devil has the ability to transform himself into an angel of light. So truly, the Christian conversion process must be deeper than just transformation. Because even the devil can engage in transformation and he trembles at the sight of God from a fearful perspective, not from a salvation perspective. But here's the connection. In John chapter 17, I believe that's where it is. Maybe it's Matthew 17, but you know, you know the story of transfiguration. Now, when Jesus is there on, 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 on the Mount Transfiguration, the Bible tells us that he was transfigured in the midst of the people, his face started to shine so brightly that it made the people and his men afraid. Now, the connecting piece is that that same terminology of transfiguration in Matthew 17, 2, is the same word in Romans 12, 2. So really what Paul or what Paul was saying to the church there at Rome was be not conformed to this world, but be ye transfigured by the renewing. Look, it's in the text. I ain't making stuff up. Be ye transfigured by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what is that good. In other words, church. When you are transformed, and more appropriately, when you are transfigured, it means that you are glorified so deeply on the inside that people can't help but see it on the outside. See, a, ch a true child of God doesn't need to fake it until they make it. A true child of God doesn't need to put on the glowing outward exterior because if they've truly been transfigured, they are glowing so deeply on the inside that no one can help but see it on the outside. So this thing is about growing stronger, going deeper, and glowing brighter. But you need the fruit of the Holy Spirit to continually be strengthened, you gotta make sure you manage your strongholds. And no, there's nothing wrong, church, with, with confessing that you have some. It's not a bad thing. It's only in the Church of Christ where we can get in trouble for confessing or asking a question. There's nothing wrong with confession. Acknowledging, this is where I struggle. This is where I hurt. Can you help me? in this area. And as we continue to manifest through that process, we are transfigured to where the people you used to run with that haven't seen you in four, five, six, 10, 20 years, they see you again and they see you glowing. They see you shining, not because of your clothes, but because of the deep spiritual word of God resonating on the inside and radiating on the inside, in, in clothes, in clothes. In my house, I wash the clothes. Now, one caveat, I don't fold. <laughs> but you know, my, my wife and I, we went back and forth in terms of what works, what doesn't work. I ended up with washing clothes. Not fo folding is a monster. So I, I, I don't fold, but I, I do, I wash everybody's clothes. And I'm good. I'm good, I'm good. My, my, my children can practically wear something on one day. And if they wanted to, it's clean the next day. 
right? And that's hard. That's hard. Because there are six of us in the house. There's six of us in the house. So that's, that's a lot of clothes. Now, we had this one washing machine that ended up being possessed. <laughs> this, this washing machine got to the point to where when it would go on the spin cycle, Brother Moore, it would make so much noise that I was almost afraid to go in there. I was waiting for one day for it to just explode and water just spill everywhere. But, but this went on for at least a year. I'm a man. So this thing is broken, but it's still washing clothes. So finally, my wife and I, we go to the store. We, we buy a new washing machine. And it was some type of uh, washing machine with the uh, energy saver, water saver, something like that. Now, now here, here's, here's, here's the reality. I put the first load in. And the thing was so smooth and quiet, I thought it was broken. So I had been indoctrinated so much to this loud, combustible, troublemaker of a washing machine that when I got one that really worked, wasn't even familiar to me. I thought that efficiency meant it wasn't working right. <laughs> there are those here who have not come to Jesus. He wants you to know that the life you currently have is not the one you're supposed to have. But you can become so fixated and accustomed to what you currently have that when Jesus is introduced to you in all of his smooth efficiency, he doesn't stand up next to the jacked up one. Because he's not as loud. He's not as boisterous. No, he's smooth and that's efficacious. He's working even when you don't understand that he's working. But every now and then we would rather be with the broke down thing than with the smoothness. And the powerful work that comes through the blood of Jesus Christ. Stand, do they stand? Just stand to your feet. Look, if you've heard the gospel, it's up to you to believe that gospel. Believe it. Repent of all of your past wicked ways, which is an itemized process. It's not a blanket. Pro God, just forgive me. No. Of what? It has to be acknowledged of what I'm repenting for. Not talking about I need to acknowledge to the people, but God needs to know what I'm repenting for. It's not just a general process. Confess that you believe Jesus is Lord. Believe that he's the son of God. Baptized in water for the remission of your sins. If you're here, you are a member of the church, but you've gone back to that old washing machine. Jesus is calling you back to the smoothness of his efficiency so that you can continue to grow stronger, go deeper, and glow brighter. God bless.